Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young, Drew Galloway, and KSU underscore fan. You get all four of us on this Sunday show. A couple of things that we're going to do. We'll talk basketball in just a moment, and at the end, we are going to talk a pretty substantial amount of football, give some ideas and thoughts from everything going on around the Big 12 because uh, we've got a little game, a little half-baked idea going on right now. Hopefully, uh, it's it's almost done by the time we get to actually doing it today, but it's going to involve the four of us making some selections and uh, kind of predicting in our own ways what we think happens in the Big 12 this season. So that's where we sit at this point in time, and uh, I guess we can just kick it off with the big news, and the most important news probably is what basketball did towards the tail end of the week where they added two more players to the roster. One is kind of uh, an interesting ad, a junior college player, and the other is a guy that scored over 20 points in an NCAA tournament game against Kansas last year and also adds some much-needed size to the Wildcat roster. So Drew and I have already kind of given our thoughts on both guys, but I'll let D.Y. fire off here and uh, just kind of give his verbal thoughts on the two additions that K-State made this past week to the basketball team. Yeah, I view a chore chore as another tier one addition along with Doug McDaniel, something that they absolutely needed, somebody that I'll be able to score as well. They're, they're, I wouldn't say short on scoring, but in terms of prolific scores, it was hard to find any on the roster, maybe outside of McDaniel, even though there's guys capable on this roster already as it is assembled of going off for 15 or 20 on any given night when you look at a Max Jones or or a C.J. Jones as well. I don't know what kind of consistency in scoring you'll get from those, but guys that you'll be able to rely upon. Uh, but a chore chore is, I think, someone that you're going to expect to get double figures every night. And the Tier 1 addition, I think he's a really good defender as well. Um, average a couple blocks per game at Sanford. I think they'll they'll want, you know, similar to that at Kansas State. So, yeah, you know, and the way that, you know, this is starting to trend, it just seems like, you know, the goal for this Kansas State coaching staff so far seems to be just to surround Doug McDaniel with a ton of length and a lot of shooters. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that formula whatsoever. Um, and the fact that a chore chore has already done something against KU, you know, in the NCAA tournament, uh, that can't hurt. And obviously that'll, you know, make him a, probably a fan favorite pretty quickly because of that. Everyone remembers what he did against the Jayhawks in the first round of the NCAA tournament, um, especially the Duck the dunk that he had, I, you know, I envision him similar to Naquan Tomlin. I don't know that he will be as, you know, Naquan Tomlin wasn't really a reliable three point shooter either, but I just, I, I have a question mark a little bit about a chore chores three point shooting. Although he shot 44% on what about 62 attempts. It just doesn't look real pretty. So I don't know how like sustainable that is. It might be, you never know. But at least being able to keep a defense honest is pretty good, and he's a playmaker and an explosive threat at the four position. So, uh, and again, just a lot of length. Um, this team is composed to be really good on the defensive end around Doug McDaniel and a lot of shooters on the offensive end around Doug McDaniel. So those aren't bad things. In terms of Moby Kakaruka, uh, junior college, six foot six wing, uh, I think there is definitely some upside to it, but I would view it as a, more of a – you know, I'm not going in with a lot of expectations here just because of his profile. Uh, but there's obviously some tools and traits to work with there that could have him exceed any expectations that we set forth for him. But in terms of how I view him, anything that he can give, you know, is probably going to be seen as a plus for me. It's more like a lottery ticket more than anything. Yeah, th I think. I agree with DY's take on a chore being a, a tier one ad from the portal to go with Doug. I think, you know, you got two of them. Um, I think it's, you know, with two spots left, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about what they go after and can you get a third tier one guy? I, don't, I think that'll be a challenge. We'll probably talk about that later, but I, I agree. A chore has a lot of skills. I, I kind of initially when I started looking at him, thought he was more like, David Gasson, but I, I agree with D.Y. that I think the more I look at him, the more he looks like Tomlin in his ability to get by people off the bounce once in a while. Um, now, granted, in most of his highlights, he's doing that against fives, uh, although he did it pretty easily against Hunter Dickinson multiple times as well. So um, I like the upside. I like his ability. I like his experience. Um, I think he'll be a good fit. 
for what this team needs um, on both ends of the floor. Um, and, and he's a guy, enough of a threat that you can put him out there and have four spots on the floor with, with Gasson or uh, Fall or whoever other big we bring in that, that you have shooters uh, outside of Doug McDaniel to, to distribute to. So that's a nice thing. As far as movie goes, uh, you know, my, my hope is that he's a poor man's David Hoskins type of player. Um, guy that's undersized, but probably is more of a four at this level, uh, maybe a three in a pinch. Um, he's, I think he's got a little bit of overlap with Buddy. Uh, maybe Buddy's a better shooter, a better proven shooter at a higher high school level than uh, we know that Moby played at, considering he came from Ireland and then redshirted a year at the D2 Juco level. But I, I like the pick. You know, I, my only concern was if that was the best guy we were going to get on the rest of the way, I was concerned. But obviously the same day we got someone way better. So I think it's a, two really good portal ads, and you feel a lot better with 11 guys in mid-May, um, late May. And the, that target date of having all 13 guys by June 1st is looking a lot more realistic than it did a week or so ago. I think it's going to be interesting with E.K. Ruka to see how that ultimately pans out because this feels like the first real ad along the lines of what we saw Baylor do a handful of times where they would get a kid that he played at some fairly significant smaller level uh, like we you know was I talked about in regards to the jump that he's making with some people like Naquan Tomlin was coming from one of the better JUCOs in the country where you know, like it's it's a whole different ball game compared to Division two junior college basketball, which is what Ikangaruka is coming from. But Baylor did this where they would find some guys from some lower end spots that you you were kind of confused that they were even playing basketball there. And those guys turned into something. And the tools seem to be there where, uh, again, like if we, I think the, the conversation goes on quite a bit with people, but the way that college basketball is structured now, if you know, the, the bottom of your roster in terms of scholarships is going to a guy like that. That's not the worst place to give it. And honestly, if you consider the way that things kind of work out now, probably giving opportunities to high athleticism type of guys that don't know exactly what their worth is quite yet and nobody else knows what their worth is at the Division One level, those might be the best because maybe it's easier to keep that guy in and develop him a little bit more than – you know, say an R.J. Jones or uh, Day Day Ames or something like that. A little bit of a different scenario, but I think that might be uh, an avenue that gets explored by more and more teams as things progress when you're looking for spots 11, 12, and 13 on a roster. Yeah, yeah I, think that, I think that the 11 through 13 spot probably needs to be that like high upside, big-time lottery ticket. And, I mean, that that's what Moby E. K. Garuka and even Bay Fall to an extent are or somebody that they're probably not expected to contribute right away, but they have a high enough ceiling that if they can reach that peak, that that's probably where K State can find that sweet spot to be in the danger, the dangerous of like Final Four, Elite Eight, Sweet Sixteen type type of teams because you're maximizing that type of potential. So I, I really like uh, Ike Garuka. He gets downhill, can dunk on everybody apparently from his highlights. Uh, but Ashore is definitely the bigger ad and is a lot going to be a lot of fun because I think that him playing the four can unlock even more potential that he has. Yeah, he's pre can be pretty electrifying. Ashore, Ashore, I do. You know, put him putting him putting him at the four. I think can unlock certain things, and I do think in ways that can make things a little bit difficult for more difficult for him because I think he had matchups to his favor at the five. And if he's not at the five, some of those go away. That would be my only concern with him. Other Anything otherwise for him excites me a bunch. In terms of Ikegaruka, I would just say his offensive skill set is either very, very limited or pretty unknown at this point. Because you guys alluded to is basically his highlight clip for the most part is just him taking one dribble and dunking as hard as he can on top of someone that's overmatched. Right. And he's well, which gonna... I, I did say to be fair is basically what junior college basketball yeah. is. There's not a lot yeah. of skill involved in that level. Uh, and I know that, you know, some real Juco diehards get offended when I say that, but 
I grew up in Hutchinson, Kansas. I've seen enough of junior college basketball. I love it for what it is. Run down the floor, get a dunk, or shoot a three in seven seconds. But that's that's what that level is. So, like, there is going to have to be some serious refining, not just in terms of how he plays, but even probably in the world of which he knows how to play the game in terms of what he's experienced the last two years. Yeah, well, yeah. even – I would even go back further because I can't imagine that the player true. development in Ireland is that great either. So he'll it'll be a learning curve. But yeah, and he and he only played twenty one games too. So I mean, he's limited on how much experience he has, even at that level. Um, I, the other guy I'd throw in the ring is kind of the upside potential is Max Jones because he was a D two Tampa player, mm -hmm. and transferred up to Cal State Fulton, did pretty well and. I think he's a guy that has potential to be uh, better than maybe some people think just because he can shoot the three and get to the free throw line pretty good. Yeah, so I mean, he's another he's, example. He's another piece. Yeah, he's another example of all the shooters that I yeah. mentioned in acquiring. My, my favorite of those, I wouldn't call him a lottery ticket. I think C.J. Jones is probably going to end up being a lot better than what yeah. people think because those guys are – kind of been tr trending upward or projects. I think CJ Jones, you could tell, I think the light bulb came on midway through half halfway through the last season. I think he's probably more ready for this level or at least has a more complete skill set than someone like a Max Jones or even Brendan Hazen or Kegaruka, to be quite honest. So I think CJ Jones is going to end up being a pretty important piece for this team. Again, going back to the Kegaruka, a limited or an unknown skill set on the offensive end. I will say this, because of his length and his clear explosiveness and ability to move laterally, like very sudden, like there is a non-zero chance that he can become a pretty really like a really good defender early on if he really commits himself to that part of the process because his traits probably lend itself more to that end of the floor than the offensive side. Yeah, I would also add on, on to this. I liked what you said. Uh, DY about you know a chore chore being moved around and you know you can get certain benefits of adding him to a, a new position and taking him away from the five but also you may have to revert I would I would use this comparison uh, a couple of years ago in, in baseball the Blue Jays acquired a guy named Dalton Varsho who started his career in Arizona and he was there and played catcher but did a little bit of outfield but primarily he was a catcher there and he was considered – his value was really good because there aren't a ton of great catchers that in terms of what they do offensively. He goes to Toronto. Well, they already had Alejandro Kirk there playing catcher, so Varsho's playing more primarily outfield. His value is was basically zapped for the first little stretch that he was in Toronto because you could find a bunch of different outfielders that could hit the way that Varsho did. His value in the lineup in Arizona was coming because he was playing catcher. So I think it'll be interesting to see – how K State finds that balance, and I think it, you know, it might take a little bit. But at the end of the day, I would also say I feel pretty confident in K State getting the most out of a chore uh, because we've seen a lot of other players kind of maximize what they can do here. So uh, I think it's going to be a, a fascinating watch. It's certainly a good ad for them, and now we'll just uh, have to wait a handful more months before we actually see it all come together on the floor. Uh, I will ask you to this, uh, in terms of the last two open spots, we know that K-State is kind of looking around. They have some pretty significant targets out there, but there aren't a ton of those left. Um, if it was up to you with those final two spots, where would you look to use them, Fan? Well, um, I, I think the obvious is if we can get Anienso, uh in the post, I think getting another five that can – provide you depth uh, to go along with fall and Gasson and uh, give you some options there to play different guys. I mean, I think that's your number one target. Uh, if you could go get a high level scoring wing like Coward or Watkins, I, you know, that would be awesome. I think that is a tougher sell now that you have this many guys on your roster and you have this many guys that are perimeter pieces. So I would say, Another C.J. Jones or Max Jones types would be my kind of high – a wing that can distribute um, that maybe is not going to be a Tier 1 guy, but probably a Tier 2 guy would probably be uh, the way I would go to fill it out along with a, a five that can play minutes next year. Yeah, I think I just 
you take the best option probably regardless of position. I don't know that you can be picky and try to arrange the pieces on the checkerboard at this point, right, to say, no, we will conserve our resources here because this position is more important. I just think that the, the number of pieces left is probably too limited to, to be picky in that sense. And it seems like the most likely, like tier one, whatever you want to call it, option that is available is you got on Yenzo. So you, you throw whatever you got left at him and let the pieces fall where they may. Uh, go back, and I do one more comment on the Achor Achor thing because I brought up like him going to the four. You know, in ways could be a good thing, in ways could be a bad thing, or, or at least a challenge. And you kind of dove into that further. What will br- provide a little bit of relief on that front is if he can continue to knock down, you know, a three a game or, or earn enough threes to keep the defense honest and stretch the floor. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with that. Like, if he can really be somebody that can knock down one, two threes a game, it'll really open everything up. And, and kind of like you guys have said, there's just not a lot of options that are left that you can really get like super picky about what you want to do with the rest of the roster. But if you can find that tier one player, I mean, you have to allocate your resources enough for that. And I think that if you can add somebody that is like a, a CJ Jones, Max Jones kind of uh, type where the potential is really there and like you can really see what they're doing uh, with what they want them to do that I think that that's something that you really need to explore because I, I just don't know if there's another like impact wing that's left in the portal. Yeah. I, and I, I will say I'm, I'm with you on maybe having some concern about uh, how consistent the shooting might be, but at least in, in some of in some of the video that I've seen from him, it at least looks like he's confident and willing to take the shot when it's there, which is almost as big of a deal as anything else in terms of what to do because we saw so many times last year that the offense would stall just because you, you didn't have guys that were even willing to take that shot. Now, you could question if they were capable of doing it, but the flow of the offense, I think even I think even missed shots are better sometimes, especially if you consider what the alternative was last year for K-State because that was turning the ball over. So – uh, it's probably better just to try and play good offense and have guys that are willing to do what they can to try and execute it. So I guess we'll see what it all ends up looking like, but uh, those are the additions as it currently stands for K-State as they uh, gear up on the basketball side. All right, let's let's uh, let's roll in here now. And what I have planned for today is we are each going to draft four teams in the Big 12 this upcoming season. And throughout the season, we will end up keeping track of – various things and adding it all up and there will be a winner at the end of the year and basically it's here we sit in may you're basically buying stock into these teams and we'll see who has the biggest return at the end of the year and you're going to get a point for a win you're going to get a point for a, a ranked win if you get one of those so that in some ways probably evens it out uh, towards the bottom. You know, if you have to take one of those bottom feeders, you're probably going to get more chances to play ranked teams because you're not a ranked team or something. Uh, and then there will be a handful of other ways to get the points throughout the way. It will all be fairly normal. So uh, I told these guys beforehand, take take teams that you think are going to be successful or at least are the ones that are left. It's, you're not going to get screwed if, uh, you know, the person that takes Colorado is not going to get more points than the person that takes Utah. Uh, So, so no negative points for like a loss. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not getting, you're, you're only building here. You're not going to take any, any, you're not going to take any losses in this. You just may have teams that only net you three points, but the benefit of having four is I think there's probably pretty well-defined tiers. uh, And so the way that it'll end up shaking out, it, it should work out for the most part. Uh, that the teams are pretty even. Uh, I think there are some some good options there for that to work out. So it'll be more fully fledged out. I'll, uh, I'll have a, a more full explanation for it later on. But today we're at least going to take our teams. Uh, in terms of how we want to decide the order, uh, I will just volunteer myself to go, uh, to go third. I think that that is 
<laughs> uh, just fair because I'm going to write down a number and you guys are going to guess it for who gets to go first. And then whoever's second closest will go second. And then if you're third closest, you go fourth. But I felt like, you know, I at least need a chance to not be in that four spot. Uh, and this seems like the fairest of ways. So uh, in terms of uh, how we're going to do that, I have written down a number between one and 100. So Drew, give me your number. Uh, we'll go 57. Okay. DY, give me your number. 11. Okay. Fan? Could not be more opposite. Uh, 35. Okay. Uh, this is actually, I thought I was going to have to do math here and everything. <laughs> it's really easy. Uh, Drew is going to have the first pick at 57. The number was 75. So oh, let's go. That way you guys know I wasn't cheating and just trying to give one out to Drew. Uh, and then Fan <laughs> is going to have the second pick. I will go third. And DY will go fourth, and then we'll snake back. So DY will get back to back, and that's why this should ultimately work out in the end. Is DY gets picks four and five, so his fourth may not be the strongest, but number five should ultimately work out. So I'm gonna scribble this down real quick, just so I have uh, the order and everything. And uh, yeah, all right, we should be good to go. So uh, Drew, if you uh, would like to lead us off here. You yeah, can I, uh, you can let it rip. Do I want to create controversy right away, or do I just play it safe? I, I you can take Colorado first. If I'm you not want. giving you any advice. <laughs> if you believe in Dion, I guess. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll play it safe. We'll pick K State first. Okay, so you're a homer. Uh, <laughs> all right, but, but but if I pick somebody else, I get killed for not taking K State first. No, well, probably from people in the comments or something. I I wouldn't kill you for it necessarily. <laughs> Uh, I assume you're you can explain your logic on picking K State. It probably seems pretty straightforward to many on why you would take them. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, K State betting favorite with Utah to win the league, and I I just trust K State. I think more than Utah without just knowing a whole lot about what is going to happen this fall because Utah moving conferences. How does that affect them? And I just think that K State's probably a safer bet, I would say, to win 9, 10, 11 games. Or all and 12. Because Cam Rising's a bum? or Yeah, because Cam <laughs> Rising is a bum because he's never healthy. Yeah. Uh, anybody had take issue with Drew's first pick? I assume nobody's going to disparage the Cats here? No, but no. I would say there is some risk involved when you're taking a first-year starting quarterback. It's true. Okay, D.Y., the doubter is back. Uh, I <laughs> DY doubts a good football team more than anybody that I've known. And I know myself. Uh, so know he's, myself. <laughs> he's down on them. All right, uh, fan, you are up next. And I would imagine I know where you're going here. Well, I mean, considering how excited their fans are to be part of the Big 12, <laughs> uh, I got to go with Utah since they <laughs> seem to love the new locations they're going to get to visit. Um, I, I'm pretty excited for their fans. So I got to go with the Utes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. They, they do seem very excited and energetic about being here. I can't wait to deal with all of those people. They seem <laughs> like real treats to be around. Uh, I think, I think Utah is probably a good one. I think it's pretty clear that it's either K state or Utah and that's where you go now I, for number three, for me, I, I don't know, because this is where we talked about it with uh, kind of when we were talking about frauds and everything the other day, and D.Y. just cornered me because I hate almost everybody that's left on here. I have some kind of reason to, to pick a bone with them. Um, man, I my favorite part is that this is your game that you wanted us to play, and you hate <laughs> every team. That's not well, I, I know I should have thought it out more. I should have volunteered to either go fourth or second or whatever, <laughs> just said, hey, I created the idea. I'm going to take the, I, I the think first fourth pick. Is good. Yeah. I, yeah, think, I think fourth, fourth is fourth good. Fourth might be the, the move. Because my problem is looking at what the value is of these teams. Mm -hmm. And I, I see a lot of teams that if you take them at three, that they could really collapse and let you down. Like I can poke holes in any of the teams – so I, I, I will say I have three teams on the next line that are identical right now. So yeah, whatever I one think, you, and I think I know that. You yeah, you're gonna get both. You're gonna get two of those three. Yeah. Um, I think I don't fully trust it, 
but I think I'm going to go with Arizona just because I think I trust the collective talent that is on Arizona more than the other two that uh, I have under consideration right now. So I will take Arizona and uh, D.Y. can have the two that I assume he's going to take here. But I just I, – they the talent is back. It's a new head coach. How does it work? I have some skepticism about kind of keeping their flow. But overall, if you gave me that team, I, I would probably trust them a little bit more. And I have no reason to dislike the pieces that are supposed to carry that team yet because, I mean, ignorance is probably bliss in this situation. I don't know enough about Arizona – uh, as I do the other two that I considered for this spot. Yeah, I I mean, it's hard not to pick them, so I can't fault you. But the fact that you have a brand-new coaching staff, you don't know if that group or core of talent will be as good under that new system and that new staff and compound that with having to move to a new conference where you're going to be playing a bunch of teams that you know nothing about. So they are definitely boom or bust. So you're going – hopefully for the boom there. So yeah. I will take and, – and not that I love these two teams either. I don't, but there is reason. There is still a lot of reason to like them uh, just as much as Arizona because there's probably – well, I don't know if there's less risk involved with the one, but there's less risk involved with the first one I'll take, and that's Oklahoma State. Um, you bring back – basically a 30 year old quarterback that's been around and knows what he's doing. And that's basically the reason why I could not take them. I, <laughs> I have too much <laughs> doubt in Alan Bowman. Still, yeah. So. He's not going to, to do anything that's going to wow you, but he's going to do probably everything that needs to be done to keep you in the race for another big 12 championship. He played for a big 12 championship already. And he's probably got maybe the best running back in all of college football and Ollie Gordon. All right. Well, there is uh, after the first round, there are the picks there. Uh, the the first two pretty pretty significant and uh, notable, and then the, the next two. That I think the draft. You know, this is a draft where it starts at three. We knew one and two going into it. The draft starts at three, and uh, maybe this is like in the new era of Big Twelve. This is like this year's NBA draft where there's really not anybody special. Uh, so it, it might get a little interesting moving forward. But Dy has the next pick on the wraparound. So, uh, D.Y., you can uh, give everybody your choice here now. Yeah, I, I said I had three teams on that tier. You picked one. I picked one, so there's one left. Now, I will say there's probably one, two, maybe three others that I would look at, probably mainly one. But I'll go Kansas just because of their ceiling. Um, yeah, the, the, the memes of D.Y. picking KU, I think, made it, <laughs> made it worth you picking Arizona at three, Mason. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> No, I got to take Kansas just because there's I, – this is the one I said might – probably has just as much risk as Arizona because you don't know what they are without Andy Kotelnicki, an offensive coordinator. There's the huge wild card on Jalen Daniels' health that's kind of spilled over, you know, for what, two years, two full years now. This will be the third. But in terms of ceiling, there's probably nobody else in the Big 12 that has as much ceiling as they do that we haven't picked yet. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think those five teams are the ones that uh, are easily have the best case to to possibly be in Arlington and the First ones one. that you have to think about as you're contending with. And I would also uh, say that, like, in terms of KU, like, I seriously considered them at, at three, but I just – the quarterback thing is a mystery there because you just don't know how Jalen Daniels' health is going to look. Even if you say he's healthy going into the season, we've seen that rapidly deteriorate. Uh, over the years and and how that follows so quarterback questions honestly for you can find ways to make it a, a question for all five of the top teams in the big 12 right now arizona might honestly have the most solidified one because fafita is talented and you know he has that year under his belt as a starter for the most part everybody else it's avery is young alan bowman really isn't talented <laughs> jalen daniels is hurt cam rising Again, I've seen Jalen Daniels play in a football game more recently than I have Cam Rising, uh, so it's 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 odd to try and figure this this thing out. I would say there's still three or four teams left that I think were, are capable of being in the top four of the Big Twelve. Yeah, yeah I would agree. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm I'm a little less certain. I think uh, since I've got the next pick, there are two that I kind of have in mind here on who I'm considering for it. Um, 
but I, I think I just have to avoid because I talked a lot of crap on this guy. I, you know, I think he's fine, but I don't think he's special. So I will not be taking that team. I will be going with Texas Tech as Sorry. my next pick. He said he will not be taking Iowa State is what he just said. <laughs> uh, no, that's not the team that oh. I had in mind. So, yeah, don't don't even try to put that oh, in. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. don't, our, I don't want to be painted as – and I, yeah, I don't, I don't even consider them in this class. I laugh when I see people put Iowa okay. State in this category. So I have Arizona and Texas Tech now, and Fan is back on the board. You are like in tortilla heaven there. I, I kind of like the Texas Tech pick. Like I <laughs> said on our other show last week or two weeks ago, the Texas Tech schedule is soft enough at the beginning that you can stockpile wins then. And if you know, if it, I'm in the business of trusting the talent, and Texas Tech is compiling the talent. They also have, you know, one of the the better running backs in the league, which there's a lot of good running backs, but uh, I, I I like their pieces maybe a little bit better, and I'm a little more trustworthy of their floor. Yeah, it's – there's a – like everybody said, there's faults in every team left. There's reasons you could put a few of these as teams that could contend for the top half of the league, maybe even the top quarter of the league, but uh, – I really am intrigued by this one, and I think they have a ceiling that could be very high, but I think they also have a floor that could be low. But I'm going to go with UCF as my next pick just because of the quarterback and the quarterback's fit with the system, I think, is a good one. So we'll see how it goes. Their first year, they were pretty up and down and competed in a lot of games that that they didn't win and had some head-scratching losses as well. So that's what I'm going with. I think, and Timmy McClain was like the most reckless quarterback known to man last yes. year. So, yes. <laughs> but, and they still made a bull game. You put KJ Jefferson in there, you would think that has a chance to be a, a couple games better. I agree. If it if it was like 10 years ago, Timmy McClain definitely could have played quarterback at Texas Tech. <laughs> if it was yeah, 10 so, years ago. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah. Anybody could play quarterback at Texas Tech the last 10 years because they all get hurt. So I guess, yeah, if, you, if you're breathing, you could play quarterback <laughs> yes. there. They probably need you. So, all right. Uh, so that leaves we got 10 teams left to be selected. Uh, actually, maybe my math is wrong there. We got nine teams left to be selected. And Drew has back to back picks now. And I feel like I've kind of backed into a corner with, with one of them because the value is probably too good to not take now like i I feel like i have to take (laughs) iowa state now that i I don't feel great about it but i'll 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 still take them i mean i i I can talk myself into it because they rank number two in returning production hunter decker or uh, hunter decker is gone and then with uh um blanking on uh quarterbacks here uh, yeah with rocco beck in and abu sama returning I, I can talk myself into this, but where I lose it a little bit is new offensive coordinator. And, and I just don't know if the ceiling is as high with Matt Campbell because the, the highs have not been as high as people would hope, but they are very together. So they can win seven or eight games. <laughs> I, I would say there's only one team left that I could have uh, talked myself into over Iowa state. So. Yeah. All right. then, uh, before Drew goes real quick, I'll throw I'll throw up on the the screen again the picks as they currently stand. Uh, I question Drew's character for taking <laughs> Iowa State there. Just I I don't know. I, I again I'm I am an idiot sometimes. I'm fully aware of that, and I'm aware that people think that. I do think the Iowa State love is a little overbearing. Like my whole point is, and this is this is not totally applicable to Iowa State because they are not this level, but. If like everybody's like, well, look at how much they bring back. Yeah, but like if crap yesterday was crap, <laughs> two days later, just because it's old crap doesn't mean that it's not still crap, you know. And again, I, Iowa State is not is not crap, but I don't know that they're also like the the golden nugget that everybody seems to think they might be with bringing things back. Rocco Beck is good, but as much as we talk about these other quarterbacks uh, and how they're kind of built on you know shaky floors. Iowa State's next best offensive player is a running back that he really only was special in two games last year. That's every other game. He was pretty pedestrian at best. So 
I think the Iowa State thing, I'll be interested to see how it ends up working out for them. They also lost their best defensive player from last year. So, But um, it also feels like when you, when you do a draft like this, you, you probably need to pick them in the top half. I, like, I, here's yeah, the thing. I mean, the, the, the remaining here's options the in the Big 12 are not very <laughs> yeah. Drew, Drew, Drew didn't pick Iowa State in the top five. He took them eight. Yeah. And, uh, Iowa State picked me. I didn't pick Iowa State. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if you pick them eighth, and I'm looking at the remaining eight teams, and yeah. none of them have as high of a floor as Iowa State. No. Yeah, that's probably that's probably true. Uh, yeah, I really – I mean, I, I'm up here in two picks, so I don't know where I'm going yet. But I, if I had this pick, I would not be overly excited about it. So, Drew, uh, have at it. I'm gonna take a take the first swing on a bottom half team, and we'll we'll go with Baylor. I, I just think that they're they're a team that has a kind of an unknown ceiling. And That's what Dequan, I'm gonna... and Daquan Finn coming yeah. in, the Mac Player of the Year quarterback. I think that they can make a bowl game, maybe surprise some teams. I just think that you can talk yourself into Baylor more than you can to these other bottom half of the league teams. Yeah, Baylor's ceiling just because of that quarterback addition. Is top half for the Big Twelve. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. We we talked about it when we did quarterbacks, whether it was this past week or whenever. And I really think that that's their saving grace in terms of how we think about Baylor right now. It's just it's such an unknown, but it does seem like they have really good upside at that position, which obviously they didn't have with Blake Shapin. So uh, I, I I get the Baylor pick as much as I don't like Dave Aranda. Uh, <laughs> Not because I don't I don't care about him as a person, but I just think as a football coach, he's a fraud. So uh, you can yeah. also not like him as a person. He's pretty boring. He's yeah, boring. you know, boring. boring's fine. He's boring. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So Drew has K State, Iowa State, and Baylor. That means the remaining teams are Cincinnati, BYU, Arizona State, West Virginia, Colorado, Houston, and TCU. Uh, fan, you are up. I think I'm going to go with the fellow purple. Horn Frogs, um, just because two years ago, I mean, they were disappointing last year for sure, but two years ago, um, obviously they had a pretty good season. So um, it's hard with, like, like yeah. you guys have said, with the remaining teams, it's hard because you got to <laughs> try to think of who's got the highest floor. Um, and I don't know that TCU does or not, but I think they still got some talent on that team. And if they can improve their defense, their offense was pretty good last year. If they can improve their defense, uh, they could move up a few legs. Yeah, I like them more than I like some of the other teams that are left. I like I probably, a lot of good ones left. Yeah, yeah I, I probably would have taken someone else besides TCU just because I hate Josh Hoover. I just don't think he's good. Yeah, I would agree with that, but I I don't like a lot of other quarterbacks worse. Yeah. That's a good oh, yeah. point. <laughs> every, every, yeah, there's a lot of flaws left. Uh, okay, so now it's up to me with my pick. This it, uh, you, it gets, you have a tough decision here. It, <laughs> it's you, real tricky you could, here. You could basically go with a really good coach. Yeah, a a flawed program with a quarterback that's a it's a circus yeah. of a program with a elite <laughs> yeah, I got, quarterback. I, I got a team with two first round <laughs> picks. What's wrong with that? You think what's what what's the holdup there? Or or you can go a team with a really good coach or a team that overperformed last year. Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not. I do think they overperformed last year. I think they only Probably. won like four games. Uh, it Probably. felt like they were in every game they played. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a tough one. I will. I'll. I'll say this uh, because this team will get taken be when I don't take them. Dy will probably make them one of his next two. Uh, the only reason I'm not taking them right now is because their schedule is really tough. And so even though I don't have the, the whole point system for, for fully formulated, I do think it's going to be really tough, even if they're in a good situation. So I will take West Virginia just because maybe there's a chance also, that a schedule. Yes. some of what they did last year is replicable. Yes. In some ways, and you know, like the Penn state non-con game, there's zero chance that they win that. <laughs> just, I mean, just immediately writing that off. Yeah, as a loss. but like they could win the game at Pitt. Like I think Pitt sucks. So it's probably not that bold of a prediction, but I don't think West Virginia makes a bowl this year. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think we're looking at a bunch of teams here that aren't going to make you, a bowl. Yeah, yeah, they have to win all three of their non-conference games, and then hope 
you play some crappy Big 12 teams and then you you sneak a win somewhere. But I'm going to take West Virginia just because I think, you know, that the schedule is at least slightly lighter than what I perceive Houston's to be. You you hope that you're less crap when yeah. you play the other crappy yeah. teams. Yep, exactly. So, uh, DY, you have back to back now. I think you, I think it's probably two pretty obvious picks for you. At least one. It, it is because one, I'll, I'll put it this way I think Cincinnati and Arizona State are absolutely trash. Like those two are <laughs> the bottom of the barrel, and I refuse to pick them at this spot. And BYU, like they have a guy that couldn't play quarterback last year in Jerry Bohannon. Like it doesn't <laughs> scream a lot of confidence. Kalani Sataki's the coach. He hasn't won in a decade, it feels like. So, and I know Sataki's your guy, Mason, but I just I, I think it's more likely he's fired uh, than they win. No, I games. think I think it's probably time to split up. I, I I philosophically I like how aggressive he is in a lot of ways, but I understand that it probably wasn't going to so, work out for him. It pains me to say this, but I got to go Colorado and Dion because as much of a circus as that program is, and it's a complete joke, they should be better than BYU, Cincinnati, and Arizona State. All right, well, let the let the record show that D.Y. took them with his third pick and not his fourth pick. So that's- well, I went in alphabetical order. And then Houston. To be honest, I think Houston might be the most overachieving team in the Big 12. Again, tough schedule. I get it and all. But all Willie Fritz does is win. I can't take – again, I can't take BYU, Cincinnati, and Arizona State over Willie Fritz. You, like the jersey and the name on the jersey doesn't even matter. You just tell me Willie Fritz coaches that team, and I'm taking it. Yeah. I can't see. I can't wait to be bullied into picking the team that I said was going to go winless. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Houston and Colorado are gone. Those were the two obvious ones there. Houston, I, like I said, they were, they were the one that I considered instead of West Virginia. But at the end of the day, I just figured like, if you're going to value what success can be had Houston's schedule. So they play UNLV at home to start their season. And UNLV is like no slouch. Uh, and then they're at Oklahoma. Then they also have to face at KU, Utah, and K-State go there at Arizona. So they they have a pretty stout schedule that could provide some roadblocks. So that's why I avoided them if I want to rack up points. I think the I think the best way to go uh, for me at this point is probably uh, BYU. But here's the issue with BYU. Um they play two road non-conference games this year, which seems like a really idiotic move on their part. They play at SMU and at Wyoming, but I will take BYU just because I feel like they're the better of the three remaining. And Kalani Sataki, as much as he's been disparaged by DY here, he he does have a little bit more juice currently at BYU than what Cincinnati and Arizona State has. So I will take the Cougars and hope that somewhere along the way I, I buy some luck. That leaves uh, yeah. the fan next to go. The, the next two are – I think Cincinnati is better than Arizona State. So yeah. I'm going to go with Cincinnati. It's a better program. Uh, I think their coach is not very good. And I don't know how talented they are, but they're better than <laughs> Arizona State. <laughs> I basically said Cincinnati's trash, but Arizona State's worse than trash. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, which is pretty like that's 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 hurtful probably to Arizona State because I I would have just looked at I I think there's like zero chance that Cincinnati does anything good with their lives. Uh, so I'm not sure if Arizona State wins a game. Like I don't, they're, they they're may such not. But like I, I think you're just like I think the upside. Like yes, they might have they might win zero games, but if you said one of these teams wins five games. I would say, yeah, somehow Arizona State does it by a miracle. And, you know, I'll take the guy that I don't think is just a mediocre loser like Scott Satterfield. So I, I don't I don't know where you see five wins. Potentially I don't. I'm telling Arizona you, State. I do not see five wins from Arizona State. But I'm just telling you that I doubt I Cincinnati because they have a crappy quarterback. They have a loser head coach like they, there is nothing good about Cincinnati. Arizona State, I can at least like, yeah, you know, Do there's some momentum in terms of how they're building. Jeff Sims. Jeff Sims. Playmaker. They don't have a quarterback either. <laughs> Playmaker. <laughs> For the other one. He's going to start in quarterback at two power five institutions. <laughs> how how that third. <laughs> uh, he's parlayed into a probably better money uh, every single time because he's ended up at spots that are desperate for quarterbacks. I don't know. 
uh, again, I'm, I'm just trying to explain to you. I don't think Arizona State is good. I don't think, you know, whatever, but I just, I'm a man of principle, as I've said this week when I'm talking about these teams. I cannot, I cannot trust Cincinnati at all. That would be silly of me. How so. does this happen to a power four uh, athletic department that Arizona State goes to Texas State on a Thursday night? <laughs> like, how, how does that happen? The they got some pull down in San Marcos. They know they know how to get people in the building there. Like I'm trying to talk myself into like Arizona State winning like two or three games, and like I'm just looking at this. Like I don't if they because even Cincinnati's on the road. <laughs> like, well, uh, let's see. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how they they end. He's up. like, let's see. <laughs> they play at hey, they play at Cincinnati. So uh, he said, let's see. He took a look at the schedule. Was like, well, I don't know actually either. Well, I look. I know. I'm saying that in terms of I don't know. I, I have we have no idea what Arizona State could look like. I mean, if, if we're being honest with ourselves, they Aren't did they find down? what. Aren't they down like ten or fifteen scholarships? <laughs> yes, I think we know what Arizona many, State looks you like. You know how many guys play pretty. in a game? It's not <laughs> you don't play like you don't need all those guys. I mean, come on, <laughs> we'll figure that out. This team, this team found a way to win three games last year. You know they they and beat UCLA. Worse safe now than they were. I was gonna say, but they actually had like a, pr- they a got pretty some, good quarterback with Rashad. no. He got hurt. He got hurt. I don't even. Jaden Rashada probably only was a, a, a part of one of those wins. <laughs> So it's all Scadaboo, their little running back from Sacramento State that Mason, you know Mason's lit it up got last. A Heisman future on Jeff Sims. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just trying to stand up. You guys know how close of games they played last year? They had uh by my by my count, they had I think they're a worse team though. They had three they had three one score losses last year to Cal, Colorado, and Washington. Ever heard of Washington? You know what they did last year? <laughs> Arizona State was eight points away from playing for a national championship, theoretically. <laughs> Though I think that they might actually beat Wyoming with uh, Craig Bull retiring. That 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 feels like a winnable game. Yeah, yeah. Well, at yeah. Texas State does not feel winnable at all. We'll see. Uh, it we'll wasn't see. winnable at home last year for Baylor, but uh, Kenny Dillingham is already a better coach than Dave Aranda, and Dave Aranda's won a Big Twelve title. <laughs> so I just. Can't stand uh, thinking about that. All right. Uh, in terms of your guys' opinions on everybody's team, because I I probably like DY's team the best in terms of consistency. I think each team, you know, there's there's a good middle ground there for everybody. Uh, but that's that's me speaking. So Drew, who do you like the most? And you can, in this case, you can say I like my team better than everybody else's. I think that I like DYs too, and then probably fans second. I, I think that pick four was was the good strat because you get two teams that you think probably have a really high floor and ceiling, and then Colorado, who knows? And Houston is probably the best coach of the bottom four teams, like easily. Yeah, yeah. I think that you could put all three of those other coaches together, and Willie Fritz is still a better coach than them. So DYs team probably is the best. Yeah. Fan, uh, oh yeah. Okay. I agree. I think D Weiss top to bottom got the best four, um, four teams that all could finish in the middle of the league and maybe a couple could finish in the top two or three. So I, I think he's I think kind of the key to this is having the, the best worst team that can win a game or two that they, you don't expect them to. Um, I would say Arizona state Cincinnati is unlikely BYU is probably not super likely. Houston, I could see though, so I, I think that's a pretty good list. I, yeah. I would take a long look at if I like my team as well, obviously, but like fan <laughs> because he has Utah and UCF both at the top, and I like both of them. And, yeah, I, and of the 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 teams picked third, he might have the best one in TCU. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to come out and say it, despite the fact that he had the number one overall pick and he got to take K-State, who is the favorite to win the Big 12. I do, in fact, hate Drew's team. Uh, I know this might surprise you guys because you, you all think that I'm an Arizona State fan for some reason. Uh, I, I, but, I'll be honest, the, the one I think is the worst, if we're going to say the worst, too, I would pick Mason's because I think wow. Texas Tech, there's a chance that Texas Tech is a disaster because what happens every year at quarterback for them. West Virginia, I don't think makes a bowl. I think they're. I think they could really tumble this year, and I really don't like BYU. So th- there's a non-zero chance you have three teams that are like 
six and hey, six or worse. That's that's fine. You know, you know, Texas Tech, they were like an eight win disaster last season, DY. So uh I guess seven, but I'll take that. I'll take seven wins as a disaster. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I do think the biggest thing that's been highlighted here is uh a lot of these teams are there are there could be significant flaws and they could be held back because and this is probably what the Big 12 is moving forward, but even your best teams are going to be built essentially on a house of cards. And mm-hmm. if one thing goes wrong, it can tumble pretty hard um, because Oklahoma State is counting on Ollie Gordon to carry them again and then having a guy play quarterback that has never really before proven that he's good at doing that. And then we've talked about injuries with so many of the others and Arizona's dealing with a new coach. Like, I just don't know that you're ever going to you should never feel overly confident about what you're going to be able to accomplish in terms of the new Big 12, and that probably has a lot to do with how tough it is to obtain depth now and also just the fact that it's going to take time for us to readjust as fans of college football to understanding you know, what the, the highest level that can be achieved from a Big 12 conference team or almost all the ACC teams is because it's no longer what it used to be. The the highs of this league will no longer be the highs of what it once was. So I think it'll be interesting to to go through uh, my, and, and kind of figure out. My takeaway was that there seems to be a consensus on who the best five are and who the worst two are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In a draft like this too, I'll, I'll say it. It's not fun when you have pick one because all the, all the good tier two teams are also gone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> since we said there's a basically a best five, Having that fourth pick was perfect because you get two of those. It's true. It's good. It's a good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody else uh, since DY had fun and I, even though it was at my expense, and he said that he hated my teams, uh, <laughs> I did. I did enjoy hearing his logic behind it, and I didn't take it personally. I just, you know, I felt like it was directed to all these others, and I was like, yeah, I do like to laugh at Texas Tech and <laughs> West Virginia and all these other schools. So, uh, Drew, who is your least favorite team that's been selected here? Uh, it's probably yours, but mine is definitely second on teams that I hate. Like yours, it's just yours. The thing that I can't get past is West Virginia over Baylor. So yeah, I feel like Baylor's ceiling is probably higher than West Virginia because I, I'm just not sure if West Virginia even, even makes a bowl. I mean, yeah, but you're confident Baylor makes a bowl. Did you see what they did last year? I think that there's ceiling that they could reach it because of uh Fennec quarterback coming in. And I, I just trust <laughs> Baylor weirdly more than West Virginia. I would say that for me this year, and I know this sounds bizarre. I think there's a better chance West Virginia wins four games than they win seven. Uh, West Virginia real, schedule is tough compared real, to Baylor. Real quick, Baylor uh, for the next, I'm, I'm looking at it here for the next five years, their non-conference games. Uh, they play at Utah this year. Then they play Auburn in 2025. They're at Auburn in 2026. And then back-to-back years, they play Oregon uh, at home and then in Eugene. So Baylor has that's not cool scheduled them. lightly with their non-conference. Uh, no, which- they haven't. But, th- but that's cool for them. The one thing I, I will say is like that concerns me a little bit when you talk about the gap between the, the big two and the, the next two being ACC and the Big 12 is how much the Big Ten and SEC are going to be willing to travel, to even travel to those Big 12 and ACC schools. And Baylor basically, you know, has it locked in for the next few years. Yeah. Uh, fan, who, who, which team do you hate the most here? Probably Drew's, mainly because I don't like the last three teams. on Like Arizona State, I really don't care. But Iowa State and Baylor, I don't like them. <laughs> he's like i just oh, have I a personal don't problem like him. Like- and, and, and D, dy i mean i don't like ku obviously uh, both your team mason and mine i there's none of those teams i really hate on either one of our teams but i think they're three, pretty interesting teams i three teams i definitely don't like in the league and they're on i, I think i might have won the won the coach lottery though with fritz leipold and uh gundy yeah yeah, yeah. i would agree with that and Dion. and Dion. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know how much talent that guy gets? He's he's great at it. He's revolutionized college football coaching. We're uh, and, 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 oh, to be honest, Drew's coaches are like the bane of Mason's existence. He is Campbell and Aranda. <laughs> I really like Chris Kleiman. I don't know if you've heard of that guy. Uh, I think he's pretty good. And, and, and you love Dillingham. <laughs> no, I see that's the thing. I don't, but like he's an unknown. So it's like he's oh, also whatever. he's also younger than me. Yeah. 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 Is so, that is that Arizona State's coach? Yeah. <laughs> he's he's super young. I think, I think he's like 31 or 32. Yeah. He's, he's, well, he's, I think he's, I think he's 34 or 35. Yeah. So I know he's, he's he's a senior citizen. New. He's a senior citizen. He's not uh 34. He he just turned 34. So uh, he's still I'm still older than him. Yeah. So we'll <laughs> the uh, only coach on here gets it. We'll we'll see how that ends up working out. I, here's here's the logic on on my team here. I am I understand that West Virginia might suck. I'm I understand BYU might suck. I know that Texas Tech never have they once reached their ceiling. Uh, but I do think that like if you're trying to pick a, a lineup of teams that like who has the best chance of getting all four teams to be above 500 or be at 500. I think DYS is probably the best choice there um but i do think that mine is probably second in terms of that where yes we can laugh and we say west virginia and byu tough schedules they suck probably we'll see what happens you're right there is a realm though where those teams do end up six or seven wins and that's kind of what i i was banking on really the only thing i think my team would be in a better light if i had like the second pick so i could take utah instead of arizona where even as iffy as I am about the Cam Rising thing, if he's back and healthy, he should be good, and they should be in a good situation there. They still that they, and, they, a bit. and they still won what eight games in a in a really good Pac-12 yeah. last year without him. Yeah, so, yeah. We'll see uh, how it goes. All right, do you guys real quick? I'll read off what I have on paper right now. This could change for in terms of how we'll uh, dish out points this year uh, for different you know benchmarks that your teams would hit. Uh, for one win, you get a point. Seems pretty self-explanatory. So the goal would be to – well, actually, the only way you get points is by winning games. So as long as you don't have a team that ends up giving you zero points, you're probably in good shape. Uh, you get an additional point for a top 25 win. So if your team beats a top 25 opponent, that's an extra point. Uh, I figure you should also value because of the the highs that come with college football – and maybe we should bump it up more, but I was thinking you get an additional point for every three game win streak you go on in college football. I like that. So That's that good. should also benefit like the higher end teams to where they could get a bigger point because they should go three and zero in non conference play. I'm talking to you, Chris Kleiman. Should go three and zero in non conference play. Let's see if we if it can happen, uh, and then. If you make it to the conference title game, that's worth two points. If you win the conference title, that's worth four. Uh, a college football playoff appearance is worth four points. You get five additional points if you win a college football playoff game. And then uh, I also, at the end, thought if you get an out-of-conference power four win, that should be worth an additional point in terms of how it works out for your league. So if K-State beats Arizona, K-State, Drew would get a, an extra point for that. That would be worth two points, essentially. Uh, if Arizona beats K-State, I would get an additional point there and so on, however that works out. So I hope nobody took a team that for some reason has a schedule that doesn't include a power four opponent this year. I don't know if that's the the case or not. Uh, congratulations to Fan, though, who gets an easy win against Baylor for Utah. So there you, <laughs> there you have it. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, any suggestions on other things? that should be worth points and how this works out. Cause I'm open to anything and this, you guys can contribute to this as well. So any suggestions on what you think is point worthy? I would maybe add something for like winning six games and becoming bowl eligible. That way there's something okay. that like the mid tier, that's how you kind of separate those. That's fair. Two. I'd, I'd yep. nope, I like that points for making the title game. The league. The, title game. Oh yeah, yeah. That you get two. You get two for that one. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. For just making it or winning it. For just making it, you get two. Okay. If you win it, you get. So you would get two for making it, and then if you win, you get an additional four. So okay. you would essentially yeah. get six okay. points. I for missed winning, that. I missed you know? that. Yeah. yeah. So there, if you if you have one of the very successful teams, you're going to 
really boost yourself, which I think is good here because, as we kind of talked about, there's probably four or five teams that have a legitimate chance of of doing that. So, is D.Y. raising his hand to speak, or was he just saying five? <laughs> He's saying five. Okay. Five. All right. There you go. Are you saying that because you have – Four and five on that list. You want to make sure we know that you. I, I, to be honest, I think I have three and five on that list. Interesting. Okay. Oh, so you would say K State, Utah, Oklahoma State. I assume would be your top three. I, I, I would take. I'm just a little bit down on Arizona, considering their circumstances. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fair. Yep. I, you, you're a Gundy guy. We, we get it. We know. If he could take last year's team to Big 12 title game, he could take this year's team to Big 12 title game that also doesn't have Texas or Oklahoma in it. So. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fair. All right. Well, that will do it for us uh, right on it, on top of an hour. We are out of here. We'll be back throughout the rest of the week. Uh, various parts of us to talk K-State football and basketball and all the news that comes up. K-State basketball still looking to finish the, the roster. A couple of open spots there. Football continues to do work. They got the commitment over the weekend from a Juco linebacker slash safety, wherever he ends up working out there, uh, and a lot of other things kind of working for K-State right now. So we'll keep you covered with all of it over at K-State Online. Find us at On3 and stay locked in right here on the YouTube and podcast platforms. And uh, that'll do it for the four of us. I'm Mason Voth, Derek Young, Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan. Thanks for watching and listening.